Hi everyone, welcome to the lecture on the digestive system. Our objectives for this lecture are to demonstrate an understanding of the health implications of human anatomy, physiology, nutrition. Uh, you're going to be able to list the parts of the digestive system. You should be able to explain the basic functions of the digestive system. Explain the principles of a healthy and proper diet and describe the role of diet and exercise on physical fitness. So what is the digestive system for? Well, the digestive system breaks down the nutrients in food and eliminates solid waste as feces. The digestive system maintains homeostasis of nutrients. So nutrients in food are broken down and delivered to the blood. The circulatory system delivers those nutrients to cells throughout the entire body. The digestive system consists of your mouth, esophagus, and stomach, small intestine and large intestine, and accessory organs. The digestive system delivers nutrients to your blood, which travels to your whole body. How, do, how does the digestive system and the circulatory system work together? So take a moment and write down an explanation in your own words. Digestive systems reflect varied diets. So these birds eat the food that they can find in their environments and the adaptations for each bird reflect its diet, the availability of water and essential ions and many other selective forces. Digestive systems derive energy and raw materials from food. So the woman and the chicks ingest food, break it down, absorb small molecules, and eliminate waste. They are heterotrophs, organisms that consume food to obtain carbon and energy. The mango, a plant, is an autotroph that uses light energy to produce organic molecules. Food is the source of nutrients and animals use nutrients in food to fuel cellular respiration and build their tissues. Nutrients are required for metabolism, growth, maintenance, and repair. And they include things like carbohydrates, proteins, and lipids, those macromolecules we learned about at the beginning of the semester, water, vitamins, and minerals. Nutrients contain important resources Potential energy stored in the chemical bonds of food molecules, such as carbohydrates, proteins, and lipids, are used in respiration to generate ATP. Chemical building blocks, those monomers that we learned about at the beginning of the year or the beginning of the semester, those are used to build the animal's body. And they include simple sugars, fatty acids, amino acids, nucleotides, water, vitamins, and minerals. Metabolic rate determines an animal's need for food. Endothermic animals, like birds and mammals, need to consume more food than ectothermic animals in order to maintain their constant body temperature. The physiological state also affects metabolism. So growth and reproduction require more energy and nutrients than simply maintaining an adult body. Baby animals often have ravenous appetites because they need lots of nutrients in order to fuel their growth. Take a moment now and explain the factors that affect an animal's metabolic rate in your own words. A varied diet is also essential to good health. The best way to acquire all the required nutrients is to eat a varied diet. So macronutrients are required in large amount, things like water, carbohydrates, proteins, and lipids. Micronutrients are things that are required in small amounts, like vitamins and minerals. A varied diet prevents vitamin deficiencies. The U.S. government's food guidelines emphasize grains, fresh vegetables, and low-fat dairy products, along with fruits, and limited amounts of meat and fat. So some examples of vitamins are like niacin. Niacin you can get from consuming liver, meat, legumes, whole grains, and fish. And niacin is important for growth and energy use. If you don't consume enough niacin, you can have deficiency of niacin called pellagra with these symptoms. 
So each of these are major important vitamins and where you can get them from, what they do for your body, and what can happen if you don't consume enough. The same goes for minerals. Minerals like calcium you can get from dairy products or leafy green veggies. They're important for electrolyte balance, bone and tooth structure, blood clotting ability, hormone release, nerve transmission, and muscle contractions. Calcium is very important. A calcium deficiency um, would result in muscle cramps and twitches, weakened bones, and heart malfunction. What are the components of a healthy diet? Take a moment, write this down in your own words, and make sure that you touch on vitamins and minerals, which are micronutrients, as well as the macronutrients that you need to consume to have a healthy diet. All right, body weight reflects food intake and activity level. Healthy diets include all of the nutrients that are necessary to sustain life. At the same time, the calorie content of food must balance the body's metabolic rate and activity level. A body mass index is a measure that combines weight and height, and BMI scores of 19 through 25 are considered healthy. Starvation occurs when a person can or an animal consumes too few calories. If a diet is inadequate, it either contains too few calories or fails to provide an essential nutrient. Famine is a cause of starvation worldwide, particularly in young children. Anorexia nervosa and bulimia are self-imposed forms of starvation, mainly affecting adolescent females in North America and European countries. Obesity is too many calories, and obesity occurs if calorie intake consistently excuse, exceeds sorry, calories spent. In the United States, the main causes are a lack of exercise and a high-fat, high-sugar diet. Appetite is under hormonal control. For example, leptin is a hormone that signals to the brain to stop feeling hungry. This obese mouse lacks a receptor protein that allows cells to respond to leptin. All right, let's look at a comprehension check question here. So once a week, Mary goes on a run before school, and she burns 330 calories on this run. On the days that she runs, she treats herself to a milkshake, 290 calories, instead of tea, zero calories. Assuming everything else in her diet is the same, predict how her weight will change. She will slowly lose weight, right, because she's burning 40 calories more than she's consuming in that day. All right, take a moment and describe the relationship of body weight to calorie intake and energy expenditure in your own words. Most animals have specialized digestive tracts. Different diets select for differences in animal digestive tracts. For example, herbivores eat only plants, Carnivores eat only animals, detritivores eat decomposing organic matter, and omnivores eat a broad variety of food. Acquiring nutrients is a four-step process. So although all diets differ, all animals have the same four-step process in obtaining and using food. So the first step is ingestion. Food enters the digestive tract through the mouth, right? The next step is digestion. The first step in digestion is mechanical. Food is physically broken down into small particles, like by chewing or by um, churning in the stomach. Chemicals also play a role here, and digestive enzymes break food molecules down into small subunits. And this actually begins in your mouth. Your saliva is rich in the enzyme amylase, which can break down carbohydrates into simple sugars. All right, the third step is absorption. Water and digested food enter the bloodstream from the digestive tract, and your small intestine is where this occurs. Food and water are absorbed in the small intestine, 
your large intestine only absorbs water. <clears throat> and the last step is elimination, where undigested food exits the digestive tract in your feces. All right. Good. So generally, animals eat when they feel hungry by putting the food into their mouth. Digestion begins in the mouth and continues in the stomach and small intestine. Chewing and stomach churning break up the food mechanically, while enzymes chemically break the molecules down into small subunits. Absorption is when nutrients move into the bloodstream and they enter the cells lining the small and large intestines. Then they move on into the blood, which transports them throughout the body. Elimination is when undigested food is expelled from the body. Feces are the solid waste that leave the digestive tract, and they're a mixture of bacteria and undigested food that never enters the body's cells. Intracellular digestion is completed inside the cells. Intra, this prefix means like within. Sponges are the only animals that lack a specialized body cavity for digesting food. They have collar cells lining the body wall of a sponge, and those take in nutrients and enclose the food in a food vacuole, a, a membrane-bound packet, like a membrane bubble of food. A food vacuole fuses with a lysosome, and that lysosome releases digestive enzymes to break down the food molecules. Extracellular digestion is completed outside cells in the digestive tract. Most, in most animals, digestion occurs in the specialized compartments outside of cells, such as in the hydra's gastrovascular cavity. The digestive tract contains enzymes that break down food, and cells lining the digestive cavity absorb the nutrients. All right, so I tell you about sponges and hydra and how they do their digestion to give you an idea of how digestion happens across the animal kingdom. But for our exam, you'll be expected to understand how digestion occurs in humans, all right? All right, digestive tracts can be complete or incomplete. And the structure of the digestive tract depends on the animal's diet. An incomplete digestive tract has only one opening. The flatworm's opening is the pharynx here. Food goes in, waste come out. A complete digestive tract, also called an alimentary canal or a gastrointestinal tract, has two openings, a mouth and an anus. So everything moves in one direction. Diet influences the structure of the digestive tract. So ruminants like elk have specialized organs, a rumen and a cecum, that help break down those hard to digest plants. And actually within these stomachs, rum ruminants contain um, huge populations of bacteria, specialized microbes or archaeans that break down those cellulosic um, plant materials, things that are really high in fiber, cellulose, that are difficult to break down. It's actually the bacteria and the archaeans that break down those cellulose fibers and release the energy that the rumen in itself can consume. All right, a carnivore lacks a rumen and has a reduced cecum. So their digestive tracts are different because they consume very different foods. Several types of tissue make up the digestive system, and each tissue type plays a role in digestion. There's epithelial cells. They secrete hormones and enzymes into the digestive tract. They absorb the products of digestion and they protect the mouth, esophagus, and anal canal from pathogens and abrasion. Sorry. Connective tissues are things like blood, which transport the nutrients throughout the body. Muscle tissue is also important. Smooth muscles. These are muscles that you don't consciously contract, like um, the lower part of your esophagus, right? You swallow food intentionally. That's something that you think about. But once you swallow, you feel it moving down through your esophagus, but you couldn't stop it if you wanted to, right? That's smooth muscle. Smooth muscles move food along the GI tract 
and aid in mechanical digestion. Skeletal muscle, these are the ones that you do consciously control. Control the mouth, tongue, and the upper part of the esophagus and the anal canal. The nervous system, these have stretch receptors that signal the presence of food in the stomach. Nerves also regulate the activity of the digestive organs. All right, so let's check your comprehension here. Which of the following is least related to the human digestive system? A complete digestive tract, heterotrophic, elementary canal, intracellular digestion, or omnivorous? Good. We don't do our digestion intracellularly. We have a gastrointestinal tract where food is broken down. We're not sponges. Describe the four processes food undergoes when an animal eats. Take a moment, jot this down in your own words so that it makes sense to you. All right, organs make up the digestive system. So the human digestive system consists of the gastrointestinal tract and accessor accessory structures. We have the gastrointestinal tract is labeled here on the right. Starts with your mouth. Food moves from the mouth into the pharynx, which connects the mouth with the esophagus. Peristalsis is the movement of those smooth muscle tissues that forces the food from the pharynx down into the stomach. The stomach mixes food. There's enzymatic digestion of proteins that occurs in the stomach. Foods move from the stomach to the small intestine where final enzymatic breakdown occurs. This is the main site of nutrient absorption and water absorption. From the small intestine, food products flow into the large intestine where water and minerals are absorbed. And the waste products exit through the anus, right? Now the accessory structures are things you may be a little less familiar with. You have salivary glands. Up here, they secrete saliva, which contains enzymes that initiate the breakdown of carbohydrates. That's that enzyme amylase I mentioned. The liver produces bile, which helps to emulsify fat. And emulsification is when fats and water are able to mix, right? The gallbladder is located just behind the liver. It stores and releases the bile produced by the liver. And the pancreas, which is located behind the stomach, this produces and releases digestive enzymes and bicarbonate ions into the small intestine. <clears throat> the appendix is also an accessory organ. It serves no function in modern humans, but it used to be more important in our ancestors, um, like ancient hominin ancestors who consumed a very different diet. Okay, we talked about these things. All right, oh, here's a good visual for the smooth muscles. So smooth muscles underline the digestive tract. Smooth muscle contraction is involuntary, and it's stimulated by the autonomic nervous system. That means you don't consciously do it. You can't make it happen. You can't stop it from happening. It just happens. So here's chewed food, and we see the smooth muscle layer is just lining these tubes in the digestive system. And we call it peristalsis when the muscle contracts kind of in a wave, which forces the food to move, in this case from the esophagus down into the stomach. Rhythmic waves of smooth muscle contraction called peristalsis move the food in one direction through the digestive tract. Muscles also control sphincters, and sphincters are muscular rings that contract to block the passage of materials. <clears throat> the sphincters at the mouth and anus are composed of skeletal muscle and are under voluntary control. Other sphincters within the digestive tract are composed of involuntary smooth muscle. For example, we don't consciously empty our stomach into our small intestine, right? that is something that's under involuntary control. All right, digestion begins in the mouth. Enzymes in the saliva begin digesting starch into sugar monomers. Teeth tear food into smaller pieces. The tongue pushes food to the back of the mouth and it's swallowed into the pharynx. The trachea or windpipe 
closes and food passes through the esophagus to the stomach. Digestion continues in the stomach. The stomach is a muscular bag that receives food from the esophagus. Its main function is mechanical and chemical digestion. So it churns and that physically breaks apart or mechanically digests the food. <clears throat> Gastric juices full of enzymes carry out chemical digestion as well. The stomach produces gastric juice, and when food is present, specialized epithelial cells lining the inside of the stomach begin to secrete that gastric juice. It contains enzymes, water, mucus, ions, and the very strong acid, hydrochloric acid. The pH is as low as 1.5, which helps break down food molecules. A thick layer of mucus protects the stomach from digesting itself. The stomach absorbs few nutrients. The stomach passes chyme, which is a semi-fluid mixture of food and gastric juice through the sphincter that links the stomach to the upper part of the small intestine. The stomach does absorb some water and ions, and a few drugs such as aspirin or alcohol are also absorbed here. The small intestine digests and absorbs nutrients. It's a long tubular organ, oops, Here we go, sorry. The small intestine is a long tubular organ filled with a highly folded layer of epithelial cells that maximize the food's surface area for absorbing nutrients from food. See how it's folded in on itself? This increases the surface area dramatically so that more absorption can occur, right? The small intestines are lined with villi, and intestinal villi are tiny finger-like projections that maximize absorption by increasing the surface area. You can see here's a picture of a transmission electron microscope image. These are the microvilli on the epithelial cells. Blood capillaries absorb digested carbohydrates and proteins, and lymph capillaries also absorb digested fats. Digestive enzymes come from the pancreas, and the pancreas sends pancreatic juice to the intestine, which contains trypsin and chymotrypsin, which helps break down polypeptides. Remember, polypeptides link together to form proteins, right? Amylase is the enzyme which helps break down starch into simple sugars. Lipase is the enzyme that breaks down lipids or fats and alkaline sodium bicarbonate neutralizes the acid from the stomach. Sodium bicarbonate is baking soda. And you know what happens when you mix baking soda with an acid like vinegar, right? They neutralize each other. Bile from the liver helps the intestine digest fats. So the liver produces a chemical called bile that emulsifies fats into small globules that actually mix with water. The gallbladder stores that bile and releases it into the small intestine. And by helping fat mix with water, bile allows lipid digesting enzymes, lipases, to work efficiently. Small intestines digest most molecules. And the end products are used to build the macromolecules used in the body's cells. Carbohydrates, proteins, fats, and nucleic acids. The large intestine completes absorption. Uh, this is where chyme is received from the small intestine. The lining of the large intestine absorbs water, ions, and minerals from the chyme. And whatever is left is eliminated as feces. So how does the body obtain energy? Well, the digestive system provides a steady supply of carbohydrates, proteins, fats, water, minerals, and vitamins to replace the materials that leave the body. All right, so let's check what we've learned. 
the protein you eat is mostly converted to emulsified fat before digestion, incorporated into your body without modification, eliminated in feces, or dismantled into individual amino acids. Good. Dismantled into individual amino acids. Your body can use these to produce more proteins, more enzymes, that your body needs to do its own growth and work. All right, describe the major events that occur as food passes through the digestive tract. I recommend you pause this video, draw a quick picture of the digestive system, and see if you can describe what happens in each of the major organs. All right, at this point, you should be able to demonstrate an understanding of the health implications of human anatomy, physiology, and nutrition. You should be able to list the parts of the digestive system from memory. You should be able to explain the basic functions of each of those organs in the digestive system and the accessory organs. Explain the principles of healthy and proper diet and describe the role of proper diet and regular exercise on achieving physical fitness. If you have questions, please make sure you jot them down, bring them to class, shoot me an email, or let's chat about them in office hours or on Zoom.